Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's episode of Kibitzing with Kagan. And I did not have to beat up my next guest, Treasurer Nancy Kopp, to get her to join us. Nancy, thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to join me today. Cheryl, it's a pleasure to be with you, Senator from Rockville and Gaithersburg. <laughs> we have known each other a very long time, and I have about a million questions for you. And so we're going to run through them all and see how we do. I um, bet I don't have a million answers, but let's try. <laughs> let's try. If you can give my viewers an idea of your childhood, where did you grow up and was anyone in your family political? Well, I grew up in Chicago in, in Hyde Park. Um, at the University of Chicago area, and my mother was very active in the League of Women Voters, and uh, and in the Democratic Party. Although it was their local version of the Democratic Party, uh, Mayor uh, Daley had a different version. Got it. Okay. So you went to Wellesley, um, like Vassar, a seven yes. sisters, but Wellesley was all women. Uh, do you think that helped form your sense of leadership and, uh, and service? Can you talk briefly about that? I think Wellesley was very important to me. I went to a large public high school in California, co-ed. And honestly, coming to a women's college made me feel liberated. Hmm. I really could focus on the things I wanted to focus on, which wasn't always dating and dressing. Right. And, um, really pay attention to the world around us. And I was in the class of 1965. So it was a very heady time. Um, and I will say that probably half the class was a political science uh, uh, major. <laughs> so it was a good time to be there. That's great. Um, but you used your political science degree. So why don't you talk about what, when you first started thinking about running for office, what motivated you? Honestly, Cheryl, I, I graduated from college and I meant to get a PhD at the University of Chicago in political philosophy, but I got married and moved to Washington and didn't have the self-discipline to finish the dissertation. Hmm. So I went back and worked on Capitol Hill for Edith Green, a congresswoman from Portland, Oregon, awesome. with whom I'd interned when I was in college. And Edith Green's uh, administrative assistant was the vice chairman of the Montgomery County De Democratic Party. Wow. And he got me to move from Mrs. Green's office, which I thought I'd never leave, to becoming the first staff member for the Montgomery County delegation uh, to Annapolis in 1971. And in 1974 was the next election. Right. It was a very democratic election in reaction to Richard right. uh, Nixon. Yes. It was the first re election after redistricting. And mm -hmm. that's when there are open seats and, and more women and minorities get elected mm -hmm. every 10 years because of that than mm -hmm. other times. And quite candidly, this is very selfish. I, I, A, I was against everything the way it used to be done. And we were the vanguard and we were reforming and we were gonna show people a thing or two. And also I just wanted to see if I could do it because it was so unlikely and nobody, including my bosses <laughs> in the Montgomery County delegation thought I would actually do it. So well, you did mixed it. Mixed motives. And you ended up serving 27 years as a member of the Maryland House of Delegates representing the fabulous District 16, almost as good a district as District 17. Uh, why don't you talk about your first campaign and what it was like to, to come to the house? Well, my first, my first campaign, my mother, who is a much, was a much more natural politician and social person than I, essentially took me around door to door in our precinct, of which she was the precinct chairman. Awesome. And, uh, and then I spent obviously a lot of time going door to door, talking to people, meeting them and found it surprisingly fascinating. Hmm. I really like to get to know people one-on-one -on -one, um, and talk about things that we were, we were all interested in and committed to. And then I showed, I got elected um, and uh, showed up in Annapolis as a, an elected uh, representative rather than staff, along with my old friend, uh, Bobby Neal, whom you know, I think, who went through the same path exactly at the same time. That's good. And I was very fortunate because the Appropriations Committee had never had women uh, on it. And the speaker at that time, John Hanson Briscoe, mm -hmm. 
insisted that there be a woman. A um, woman, a woman, one. <laughs> a woman, and then he changed to two. Hmm. And actually the, the man who was chairman of the uh, uh, judiciary committee that year was from Rockville, from your district, uh, Joe Owens, mm -hmm. and a very conservative fellow yep. who vouched for me with the conservative chairman of the appropriations committee, essentially saying, we know her, she's worked for us, she's a nice person, she won't cause trouble. That's funny. As it ended up, both I and my District 16 running mate, Marilyn Goldwater, huh? uh, were the first women, they, they appointed both of us okay. to serve on appropriations. And it was, was just the beginning. To just for folks who may not remember the name Bobby Neal, he served in the House, in the Senate, became a cabinet secretary, switched from a Republican to a Democratic Party uh, with Mike Miller's wheedling and, uh, and served as the Secretary of Health, has had a lot of hats. Yes, and, and actually was also Anne Arundel County County Executive. That's right, mixed that's up right. In he there. was. Yes, he was right. an incredible, yes. Yes, I always said he couldn't, he couldn't keep a steady job. <laughs> I, I just then had spent a meeting, the next, uh, just had a meeting in the Bobby Neal room actually last week. So he's and he, he remains a very close friend, actually. He's nice. a great guy, although we mm -hmm. don't always agree on things. Right. But you uh, talked about, yeah, go ahead. With the, I then stayed on of the Appropriations Committee. Yes, you did. Uh, for 27 years. And it was wonderful. I loved it. So let's talk about, I'm going to come back to appropriations, but. Um, I had remembered, you had talked about your very, you know, okay, so first woman on appropriations. I had remembered you as the first woman legislator in Maryland to give birth while sitting in office. Sarah. And my staff learned that you were the first in the nation? As far as we know, That's yes. crazy. In the, the, national, the National Conference of State Legislatures did a study on it when my daughter Emily was born. And that was their conclusion. Wow, that's amazing. Well, so talk briefly, and we'll go back to legislative stuff, but talk about what that was like to be a pregnant legislator and then to be a mom, maybe a nursing mom of a, of a little one. How did um, that go? No, actually in that generation, we, were, we fed them with bottles, which okay. I subsequently regretted actually, but that that was that she it turned really out is. fine mm -hmm. um yeah in my first term in 1976 uh emily francis cop became the first uh, child born to a uh, a woman legislator Amazing. in in the u.s as far as we know yeah. and i will say going back to district 17 cheryl yes. it made your uh delegate bob jakes who sat with me on the appropriations committee very, very nervous. Uh, Emily was born in uh, October. And by August, uh, Bob was saying, well, maybe, maybe I me, shouldn't shouldn't come to uh, uh, committee meetings. At that point, the committees used to meet during the interim, shouldn't come to committee meetings anymore, because you never knew what was going to happen. And he was getting very nervous. Oh, no. But, but he lived with it. All right. Um, and, uh, and I will say it was very different then than it is now. Actually, when Emily was a baby, um, and then again in my second term when I had my second child, my son Bob, we never had pictures of them campaigning with me. Mm. They didn't come to events. Um, a, I was overly protective, uh, but B, I would get questions about why I wasn't at home taking care of the children ah. uh, instead of uh, serving uh, in, in, in public office. Right. And we just came to a conclusion that we had two separate lives. I think it's much better now. I yeah. wish, although my children both have become very interested in politics and very involved in, in the community. Right. Uh, but, I, but I wish we had been able then or had the courage then yeah. fortitude then to do it the way you could do it now and and really have one complete life so it used to be that women would wait would have their kids wait for the kids to grow yeah, up that's right uh and then run for office in their 50s or 60s or 70s or something yeah. and so they weren't around in elective office long enough that's to exactly really right. that's why life. i was the, that's why i was the first to have a baby really yeah. it, it, it was not me um even in Maryland until then, most of the women, for instance, our own great women from Montgomery County, Helen Koss, 
Lucy, Lucy Marr, Peg sure. Schweinhout, mm -hmm. had all um, been very active in the community. Most of them had been uh, presidents of the League of Women Voters. Lucy had been on the school board and on Montgomery College board. Mm -hmm. um, they had all been to a, con a Maryland Constitutional Convention, but they didn't run for yeah. state office yeah. until they were in their uh, probably 50s. Yeah. So talk about Robert, because it takes a special kind of spouse, especially oh, in the does. 70s, to, uh, to support yeah. a woman in office. I know what that's like, you know, in the 90s, in the 2000s. Yeah. And yeah. My, my wonderful like husband uh, was a career attorney at the uh, Department of Justice. He was for 20, more than 20 years, the head of the appellate section of the civil division. Mm -hmm. And among other things, the civil division uh, um, uh, uh, defended the Hatch Act, which stopped uh, uh, public employees Partisanship. Federal, from, from being involved in partisan. I always say it's the Hatch Act, actually, which kept our marriage together. That's because funny. He did not go yeah. to any events. We yeah. did. We had a bumper sticker on my car. We had a sign on what I said was my half of the front lawn. Right. But, but basically, as I said before, it was two separate, yeah. separate lives. And he was wonderful with children. He still is with our grandchildren. That's great. And and honestly, Robert had the fun and rewards and difficulties of doing an awful lot of the child child mm -hmm. raising. And um, I will admit, uh, the cooking also. He liked to eat. It actually was only with the beginning of the pandemic, Cheryl, that I've started cooking. Wow! I, God, I love it. But um, good for you. But he was he he was just terrific, and we also had a a, a, a wonderful housekeeper named Fay Fay McPhee, who was going to come and work for us for uh, the months when Emily was one during the session. Uh -huh. We all went to Annapolis, and and Fay lived in Annapolis. Well, she ended up coming back to Montgomery County and staying with us until Bobby was in high school. That's fantastic. But, that, yeah. that makes all the difference. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back to appropriations. For those who may not be aware, the House Appropriations Committee, along with the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee, deal with the state budget. And prior to the, uh, the con constitutional amendment, right. uh, we had what was called in Maryland, a strong executive budget where the governor wrote the budget and the House could basically cut and sometimes move things around. And, and then we had bond bills, capital budget. But why don't you talk about the process and talk about what uh, what some of the biggest excuses you would hear from cabinet secretaries who wanted to defend their budgets? Well, because of this uh, system that you described, the main role really of, of the legislative budget committees was reviewing the programs. We got much more into programs than in many states where they construct the budget from the get-go. Um, and because of this system, it sets up a sort of adversarial relationship, I believe, between the executive branch, the secretaries, and the legislature, which looks at the budget in terms of cutting as well as pushing some program, using the process to push mm -hmm. programs we mm -hmm. might think are important. And the staff, the legislative staff, the nonpartisan central staff, which is brilliant and terrific, yes. um, takes it on as their role to find problems with programs mm -hmm. or what they consider excess. Mm -hmm. and, um, and almost every session of the 27, our goal was to cut the budget for two reasons. One, because you have to have a balanced budget and we were concerned that it would not be. And secondly, because traditionally, if we cut the budget, we could say to the governor, well, we found, we found this money. And if you send it down in a supplemental for these important legislative priorities, it will be approved. Yes. And with most of the governors, it worked out to be a very good system. That's great. Governor um, Hogan did not. Uh, go along with that. And I know you've seen, well, you, you were in the General Assembly, um, 
at times when he would rather sit on the money yes. and support yes. uh, the programs. Even for issues like rape kits, rape testing yes. kits. I mean, it's yes. astonishing some of the battles that he's yes. picked. I, I it, haven't really understood those. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that, that was the role of the General Assembly. So, of course, the, the secretaries, as you point out, would come and say, we need all this money. And we yeah. would say, well, you don't really need that money for that, do you? And they would you know, the sky's going to fall of if you course. don't give me. This position right. has been empty for four years, but I right. desperately, I'm about to fill it. Please right. don't cut that right. position. Right. So I, I think we actually did go too far sometimes. Mm. Um, after all, we were not responsible for actually managing something. And in fact, especially in the early, early years, we had things known as management cuts. Um, this is within the Appropriations Committee, I think when you were there even. And the point was, let's cut this and see how they manage. Mm. It, that's not a good attitude. Mm. So before we move on from, from appropriations, we really have to talk about the phenomenal, brilliant, late chairman, Pete Rawlings. Why don't you just give a, a brief uh, sense to, to the viewers as to what he was as like? As you know, Pete was one of my dearest friends in, in Annapolis for, for years. Pete Rawlings uh, was representative from, from Baltimore City. He came out of the projects and um, through sheer dint of great intellect and, and forcefulness, got himself through college yeah. and into the PhD program at the University of Maryland College Park. He, like I, never finished his dissertation. So we started out with that, that in common, but Pete was a brilliant politician, I believe. Um, he was always three or four steps ahead of everyone else. Yeah. And, uh, and his goals were very much my goals and, and yours too, I believe, mm -hmm. um, supporting education, social services, things the community does as a, as a whole for all of its all of its members and uh, he was just brilliant i think in getting getting these things done getting reforms done he he sometimes attracted a lot of negative attention mike miller and he had an ongoing uh, ongoing yes. feud yes. but um, but i can think of few people who i think made a stronger impression, positive impression, and long-running impression mm -hmm. on, on the state, mm -hmm. on the city, on the educational system. Mm -hmm. The reason we've gotten to Blueprint yep. Maryland really is uh, uh, Pete, Pete Rawlings is key to, to all of that thinking. So I have uh, to and tell he you. chaired the Appropriations Committee. Of course. So I served two terms in the House, and my first term was on a committee that no longer exists. And when I, when we were getting a new chair, who wasn't someone I wanted to work with, I asked the speaker to shift me. And while I wasn't so excited about appropriations, I wanted to watch Pete Rawlings. And I spent four years watching and learning from him and from you and from others. Uh, and that's uh, that was a phenomenal opportunity. Well, the fact is the budget is central to every, I believe, Absolutely. it's central to everything. You can pass all the policy you want and you should, and policy is very important, mm -hmm. but without the resources behind it, things get, get lost. Right. And Pete understood that. And even with the limited operating budget powers of the legislature- In Maryland, yes. In Maryland, um, which are going to be different starting next year. Yep. Um, e even when we could not add to the budget, there are a lot of things that you can do, either moving things around the way I suggested, or even through commissioning studies yep. that turn into proposals, that turn into programs. And the other thing that Pete was good at, and and uh, and I don't I want to talk about with. Pete anymore. I want to talk about yeah. you. No offense. Well, I'm one cut. of the things I did, and I got Pete to do it. Pete could sometimes be adversarial, but very often, if you sit down and talk to the people who manage the government, manage the departments, the secretaries or division heads, they want to do the same thing you want to do. Sure. And working together, you can move things around yes. um, without passing laws that, so, that, are, that are very helpful. 
Nancy, I, I don't know whether you will remember this, but I really have to take the time for a personal story about you, which was in my very first year in the House of Delegates, I had what is still one of my very favorite bills, and it was a one sentence bill, and I called it tuition equity. And the University of Maryland was charging $300 more to take the exact same class at the Shady Grove campus than at the College Park campus. And I saw it as ripping off, you know, their vision of rich Montgomery County folks. And uh, so I put in a one sentence bill um, outlawing that. And you said, you know what? I'm going to withhold, you put in budget language to withhold $1 million of funding from the University of Maryland until the Board of Regents changed their policies. And so <coughs> while that bill died, we got it fixed. And that was thanks to you. Yeah, I, I, I remember that yeah. um, because j just a moment's ad, Montgomery County created Shady Grove. Right. It, it, it serves not just Montgomery County, but it is unique around the state. Mm -hmm. It allows people to go to college who couldn't otherwise be, and, um, and it's and work, really or raise important a family to the and... success of the whole, of the whole, uh, whole Maryland, Maryland system. Yeah. But people didn't recognize that at that point. I, no, that was, that was great. I love that story. I tell that story often, and obviously I always give you credit for it. Um, what is your proudest accomplishment of the 27 years that you served in the house. And then we're gonna shift to treasure. There, there were a lot of things, but I would have to say, I think the most important was in the end, um, and I was one of many people, I, but the creation of the university system of Maryland mm -hmm. out of the old state teachers college uh, system and the University of Maryland, which at that point was only College Park, uh, UMBC was new, the professional schools in Baltimore and UMES. And to bring together a whole system meant that everybody could, could rise. And I think we have. I think, I think that the university system of Maryland is now nationally around. It's better known outside of the state than within, actually, mm -hmm. but very well known in the state, too. And it's one of the leaders. And College Park is one of the leading research campuses in, in the country. They actually had very great concerns about this reform because they thought it would drag College Park down. Yes. But on the contrary, yes, go in the other direction. That's great. So in 2002, you were elected by the House and the Senate to <laughs> succeed Richard Dixon, our former House colleague, uh, to become Maryland's state treasurer. So why don't you talk about why you wanted the job and what the transition from a, a Dixon treasurer's office to a cop treasurer's office was. Well, as you pointed out, I had been in the General Assembly for 27 years at that point. I loved it. It was a great honor. Um, but uh, I wondered what it would be like to have a different, still stay in public life. Um, but with a different role. And uh, our colleague, who actually had been my subcommittee vice chairman years before, mm -hmm. uh, decided after the 2002 session started, right. that because, for health reasons, he really had to resign. Right. And we, because of the treasurer is important to the General Assembly as well as to the state, we had to find a new treasurer, elect a new treasurer quickly. Yes. And um, our dear friend, Pete Rawlings, sort of said, you should go do that. Mm -hmm. And the Speaker of the House, Cass Taylor, who many of us thought would want to be mm -hmm. treasurer, mm -hmm. decided that he didn't and supported me. Mm -hmm. And so in, in, in two weeks, and I usually, as you know, take a long time both to talk <laughs> and to come to conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, in two weeks, I decided that I would try to do this. And yes. so I went around and talked to all our colleagues and, yes. and, and ran. And in Maryland, of course, we are one of five or six states where the legislature elects the treasurer, a wonderful system. Mm -hmm. um, and then that term was that year, 2002. And when 2003 rolled around, there were some challenges. Other people thought they would like to be treasurer, but I had decided 
that actually it was a great opportunity, uh -huh. um, both for me and for me to serve in a different in a different way. And so I ran for re-election and was re-elected. Yay. So what yeah, were some but, of your early goals as treasurer? Yeah, it, it, well, my first goal, quite candidly, was to understand what the treasurer does. I mean, I had not been studying up on this, on this job until then. But um, as you know, the first, uh, the first woman treasurer was Lucy Moore, right. uh, with whom I shared an office for a number of years. Nice. She was and, awesome. Uh, yeah, she was wonderful. Yeah. And, um, and, and so I had talked to her a lot mm -hmm. years earlier about what the treasurer does. Um, but the first thing I did was A, learn what the treasurer does, and B, start raising some questions about why the treasurer does what he does the way he does, and C, had a transition committee in place that looked at the office and came back to me, and, and Bobby Neal, by the way, was, was on it, um, with, uh, with some uh, proposals for changes. One of them, the, the treasurer represents the state in borrowing for general obligation bonds, the things that go into hospitals, uh, uh, colleges, schools, school construction. Um, and we go to market twice a year, traditionally, and we still do. And so the first sale was coming up in a, about two months after I was first elected. And interest rates had gone up and down. We had some bonds that have been outstanding for up to 15 years. We only borrow for 15 years. Um, and interest rates were lower. And so my question was, can we refund these bonds? Can we essentially buy back some of the bonds that are uh -huh. out there and reissue them at a lower rate? I mean, basically, and save taxpayers money. Like refinancing our house. Like refinancing our house. And the answer is yes, there is a provision in our bonds that say they can be called. And you pay a little more. The state pays a little more for that. Right. Um, the comptroller, William Donald Schaefer, former mayor, former governor. Not a fan, uh, sorry. He opposed doing that because he bought bonds and he didn't want them. <laughs> I said, I didn't think that was sufficient. Yeah. And so, How about not ethical? Can we yes, start with and, that? And and Richard had, for some reason, never done it. So we had not yeah. uh, uh, reissued bonds. We, we had not recall bonds in decades. Wow. Um, so the first, the first thing I did, the first thing was different, actually was to do a refunding. That's and cool. we saved a significant amount of money. And uh, for somebody who honestly didn't know what she was doing, I thought that was pretty good. That's pretty good. So talking about bonds, uh, the, our rating agencies, the three rating agencies, Maryland has a AAA bond rating and has, and it is a prized attribute of our state. Um, why don't you give a two second uh, intro as to what that is? And then did you ever worry about whether we'd lose it? Did you ever have to struggle to struggle to defend it? Um, it, it, before you go to market, which, as I said, we do we do twice twice a year, you meet with the three different rating agencies, and they can rate you from, I guess, from B up to up to AAA. Um, quite candidly, well, we say it's our good government and our our conservative still... accountability. Maryland has great strengths because of our workforce, mm -hmm. because of our education system and the high level of education of our workforce, which means people can move um, from, from job to job mm -hmm. more quickly in, in adverse times yes. than in some place like the old Detroit, where you had auto workers who knew how to do auto working and that, right. that was it. Um, and we have a a high income. So we have a strong state econ economically. And on top of that, we actually have a very good government structure, of 24 jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and each one is a school district. Mm -hmm. it, we're not places like 1100. We have limited investment. We have conservative investment um, practices. And we have a system where we have good a staff revenue estimates that's approved by the revenue board of revenue estimates, the comptroller treasurer and, and secretary of budget. Yeah. And they make 
uh, uh, revenue projections that the governor has to use for his budget and the legislature, and that will not change. So talk about a time when, if you thought that we might be in peril of losing our AAA. So there, there were a couple of times, um, most particularly in the Great Recession, yeah, where it looked like we were in free fall for a while. And um, th the needs were very great. Mm -hmm. And our pension system, because of this, was was dramatically becoming dramatically underfunded. So there were a lot, there were great demands, debt, and revenue was coming coming in less than had been projected. We had serious concerns there. The United States of America was put on credit watch, you'll recall. Mm -hmm. um, and so for a little while, we actually rated higher than the sovereign, which sounds impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but but we pulled together, we talked to them, we showed them our numbers, and in fact, we did maintain it. We had, in some ways, we are not as strong as some of the other AAA rated states. Our, our debt outstanding is greater uh, per capita, not per income, per capita than some, because we, the state, uh, takes part in school construction. Yes. In other, other states, some other competitive states. They don't, and so it looks like they're mm -hmm. they borrow less. Mm -hmm. But there were times like that, okay. and even now they raise issues about things. One of the questions that they ask, they're beginning to ask more and more, is what are you doing about climate change? You're a coastal yes. state. Yes. How is that factored? You into reported on that recently. I was very so impressed. So let's pivot because I just have two more things that I want to talk about and then we'll go to our fast five. Um, the Board of Public Works yes. is a very prestigious key decision making body and you have served on it. So it is the state treasurer, the governor and the state comptroller. Why don't you talk briefly about the dynamics uh, of being on the Board of Public Works and then if you could also speak uh, briefly about the recent vote on I-270 and 495 expansion and that First vote. Well, let me say, uh, one of the other things the Board of Public Works does is cut the budget um, when the legislature is not in session yes. because we have to have a balanced budget. And that's another reason for AAA, AAA bond rating. Mm -hmm. Yes, the governor, the comptroller, and the treasurer sit every other week and review billions of dollars worth of contracts and procurements uh, every year. Every major procurement is supposed to come before us. Most of these, and these come up through the governor's uh, agencies. Right. So the governor approves of most of them or they wouldn't come to us. And then you've got the comptroller and the treasurer. And we have, we share um, a, a, a great respect and concern about the procurement process itself and dedication to transparency. Yes. The virtue of the Board of Public Works, really, it's unique in this nation, is you can see decisions being made that in other states are made behind closed doors. And well, okay, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. The public dog and pony show is transparent and public, but that right. you can't say that there aren't behind the scenes conversations or deals. Uh, no, you can't. Okay. But in the end, you are accountable for what you say and, totally. and, and do. Yep, I get that. Um, but, but it it has been used increasingly. It was used some in the past too, but I think increasingly as a platform, simply as a public, a bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, and more and more in this election um, season, to discuss issues that aren't even necessarily related to the agenda of the Board of Public Works. Hmm. I don't think that's appropriate, but that's life. And as a political junkie myself, of course, I enjoy sitting back and watching <laughs> performances. But you didn't sit back. Talk about 270 and well, your I didn't. role. I, um, the latest big issue before the Board of Public Works, obviously, was the widening. It started out being the widening of the Beltway. It, it in the end, was the the widening of the American Legion Bridge and 270 up to the ICC 
at which point it goes back into its narrow street, creating more of a I, I believe, bottleneck. Yeah, more of a and, bottleneck. We, and pricey toll lanes. We've got to say pricey toll lanes. Yes, um, and to be done as a public-private partnership. Yes, with a company from, um, as it turns out, company from Australia, which is the same company that built the Virginia, Virginia. and and they sort of have dibs on the work for the next. 50 years. Mm -hmm. My concern as treasurer, I have a role as treasurer to look at the financial implications of this, of this contract and this scheme. And I don't think that we have an, had enough information made public and transparent right. to come to a conclusion. We, the assumption was it had to be done as a public-private partnership because there was no other way it could be done. But we were never showed. No what the alternatives were. Right. That was one of the issues. The other is the environmental impact, which is, you know, was, it caused great concern uh, uh, to me. I think, I, I wanna be very candid. Um, something does have to be done with the yes. American Legion Bridge. Yes. And obviously something has to be done with congestion. Widening a highway is not the only way to deal with congestion, right. however. Right. So that, I mean, that was the issue. Um, when you're on the board of public works, you have to learn how to count to two. That's it. <laughs> and so there was a vote two to two to one to support that project, regardless of these concerns. And we'll see what happens. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for your thoughtful leadership, and uh, it was nice to have your steadfast um, and and uh, and fact based, not political. Yeah, I mean, I positioning, it, but it, it's, it's fine. It is what it is. Yeah, increasingly, um, in so many platforms, you, it's hard to get people to just focus. On facts and numbers. So before we go to our fast five, I just have one more question for you, Madam Treasurer, Madam Longtime Delegate. What's a legacy that you would hope to leave uh, behind you? Well, one is uh, I hope I've had some role in bringing more women more people focused on, on, on government and the importance of serving, the importance of a process, the importance of all the things that we talk about, um, comfortable, becoming comfortable coming into public life. And there are many ways to do, emerge Maryland, you know, is mm -hmm. one of them. But uh, to me, I think that's really important. And introducing, most recently, introducing this whole discussion and focus on climate change. Yes. And I would hope that my successor would, would pick that up. On the Board of Public Works, we should not be building a state infrastructure without a climate change lens, how it exacerbates it mm -hmm. or how we, we deal with it and assure sustainability and resilience. That's great. The investments of the pension system, everything we do, we should have that lens. It is absolutely... It's essential. If we don't, we lose the game. Yeah. Well, Nancy Kopp, fast yeah. five. Five very quick questions for folks to get to know a little bit more about you uh, with some offbeat uh, queries here. So first, if you could give yourself as a child advice based on the wisdom that you have now, what do you wish you knew? To speak up from the beginning and focus. Don't be distracted. As they say, keep your eye on the prize. I don't think I did that enough. I like it. If you could change any one policy in the state of Maryland, what would it be? Golly, there's so many. Um, Cheryl, I don't know. One of them has just been changed, and I don't know what we, I, I worked for a long time to get the legislature the authority to move funds around in the budget. Now we've got it. I'm not sure you got to use it well. Right. Um, okay. Um, who would you want, which actress would you want to play you in a movie about your life? My favorite one is no longer with us and hasn't been for many years, but it would be Catherine Hepburn. Nice. 
Great pick. Okay, I like it. Uh, question four. Do you have a motto or an inspirational quote that guides you? My mother always said, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And I, I honestly do keep that. Uh, I like it. That's great. Yeah, it's hard to live up to. It's yeah, hard. I imagine. The last question. Treasurer Nancy Kopp, phenomenal leader, longtime legislative powerhouse, and wonderful person. What is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent that you have that most folks can't do? I don't think there's much I have that other people can't do. You just have to decide to do it. That's too modest. Come up with something. No, no, quite candidly, I don't take myself so seriously. I'm I'm in a situation which I can afford. Um, I speak to you as a colleague to lose an election. I mean, my strength is that it's not the end of the world mm -hmm. and that you have to keep your eye on what you really are there for. I think we all know that, but sometimes we get distracted and forget it. I um, think that's true. You no. Know, don't be afraid. Don't run to get reelected. That's not a good reason for running. And I learned that. Yeah. Well, good for you. Well, Nancy, it has been such a pleasure to know you, to work with you, oh, to yeah. watch you. And, and um, well, I remember when you first showed up in Annapolis, you were a brilliant, energetic, focused young woman and you haven't changed much you've just You're so kind thank hard. you thank you thank you for your lifetime of service maryland is thank so you. much the better for your having been at the helm i'm grateful for you and it's been wonderful to kibitz great all kibitz the best good bye-bye take care